20 million a year. <laughs> now, I'm convinced a lot of that is because he needs total control over every moment of his day, which includes you no know, random conversations with people he doesn't want to see, which is why he is constantly surrounded by a bubble of a security detail that accompanies him when he moves from one office within Parliament Hill down back corridors, never down the same corridors other Prime Ministers used, down the back way and to his desk. And he shows up in the morning. It used to be, again, I used to see some Prime Ministers, particularly Joe Clark, used to just puff it, you know, walk like a mortal man across <laughs> the vast space between Langevin Walk, across the street, and up the hill. Sometimes I saw Paul Martin walk. She had a correct hand sometimes. Well, Rudy was usually. Wait, wait, the cars in which the Prime Ministers usually arrive, they have a, an RCMP car in front, an RCMP car behind, and in the middle, uh, a bulletproof <coughs> sedan. It was very impressive. Mm -hmm. And they used to pull right up to the members' entrance to Parliament. And I saw them, well, when I was on the hunger strike, I observed them closely. <laughs> you may not know, for 17 days I sat in front of Parliament on a hunger strike. I observed many things and the daily routine of them very closely. Prime ministers would always get out of that door and then head right in using the member of parliament entrance. <coughs> what else would a member of parliament do but use the member of parliament entrance? Well, Stephen Harper likes everything Obama has. So, except the climate, except the climate policy. <laughs> he arrives with RCMP car in front and RCMP car back and in the middle, three big black smoky glass SUV vans with their bulletproof. And so that way you never know which one he's in. <coughs> and he drives right by the member's door, keeps on going, goes to the rear entrance where he's then surrounded by the security detail that makes sure no one comes up to talk to him. And then he goes. So I think Stephen Harper is afraid of anything out of his control. Anything random, anything unscripted, anything for which he is unprepared. What's about a psycho? I'm not diagnosed. I'm not equipped. I don't have the skills. He's <laughs> certainly <laughs> off right. the one that the gentleman was asked to you. Uh, oh. Perfectly what was the question halfway up? The crazy oh, bird. No. <laughs> oh, sorry, Russ. Sorry, Russ. Okay. Right. The crazy. It's not that. Okay, but there are ways to remedy questions. The problem with your suggestion is that since my assertion is that Westminster Parliament of Democracy is that all members of Parliament are equal and that all 308 of us have a right to be there every day and do the best we can to participate, I wouldn't want to zero it down to one or two. We could do a lot to improve question period. One way would be if the Speaker of the House exercised the kind of control that a Speaker can in our system. I once asked Flora McDonald, and she said she didn't think we'd had a good Speaker of the House since Louis Lamoureux, which is in the 1960s. Uh, certainly, um, it, 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 the Speaker of the House has the ability to refuse to, to recognize a member whose behavior has been unacceptable. The Speaker of the House actually has the powers to tell a Minister of the Crown that the answer that's being given must be at least responsive to the general subject matter of the question, <laughs> which no longer happens at all. Now, one of the things we could do to really improve question period would be, uh, and I try, if we could get cooperation between the Liberals and the New Democrats before the next election, so those of you who might be, I hear Tom Mulcair is coming to Victoria on Monday. If any of you happen to chat with Tom Mulcair or Justin Trudeau, as things roll along, please encourage them to be willing to do joint strategies during question period so that we can all be more effective. They're so busy trying to get points and strike for blows against each other, which is relatively pointless given the threat, that they allow the conservatives to get away with things. Uh, for instance, we had this great idea, and it's a brilliant idea. It wasn't my idea. It was, it was, I'll tell you, it was Frank Valeriot from Guelph. He's a liberal, and we have this all-party climate caucus that, that I started after I got elected. We bring in scientists, we do briefings, and I tell you, people from all parties, conservatives, liberals, and New Democrats, the meetings are off the record in private, but we quite often leave those sessions being briefed, thinking, as they often express it, how is it that day in and day out we continue to ignore this as the main issue? Why do we ignore climate? How do I get my own party to pay attention? This is from all the guys in all the different parties. But this one day, Frank said, you know what we should do? We'd have one day where the, all the opposition questions, the liberals and the, and the NDP and the bloc and you and everybody, one day, every question's on climate. Mm -hmm. Every question. Yeah. Because the conservatives only have two or three talking points written, and they don't, they're not allowed, they're not allowed to go off script. Within two or three minutes, they'd be weak in the knees, sweating.
everybody to the page later. That's stammering as they read out the same bad answer that was written for them for the first question that somebody else answered 15 minutes ago. By the end of the question period, they'd be jelly on the floor. So I thought, well, this is the best idea I've ever heard. So it, I'm looking ahead at that point. This was in late March that we had this idea, Frank, and I thought, great. So I tried to pitch it to the Liberals and the NDP to do it on Earth Day. April 22nd was a Monday. Now I've said it out loud and it will probably end up being reported but to somebody, but it's such a good idea. I mean, this was why Justin Trudeau had so much fun with Peter Kent. Uh, uh, not the other one, but the, I don't know if you remember this, but there, when they were cutting all the ozone science, and I did try to coordinate. I managed to get Kirstie Duncan from the Liberals and Megan Leslie from the NDP. I ran between them and said, are you guys asking questions about ozone today? Okay, what are you asking? Okay, what order are you in? Okay, and I went back and forth. Okay, Megan, you're going to be going first, and Kirsty's question is this, and then whatever there's left, I'll follow up. It's actually pretty good, but it's very rare to get that to happen because they're not supposed to be helping each other. <laughs> so this one, but they always read the same answer out. So Justin Trudeau, having figured out, because he is smarter than the average bear, no matter what you heard, he figured this out. He decided to ask a question on ozone. And he had it prepared, obviously, to ask about the cuts to the, the technology. And instead, I could just see, because he used to sit right next to me, I could see that it was, a, it was an impulse. Shifted gears and said, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Minister of the Environment, define ozone. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter Kent, poor soul, because he clearly knows how to define ozone. I don't know what you think of Peter Kent, but I'm quite sure the man could define ozone, but he wasn't on one of his cards. <laughs> uh, he had no pre-approved PMO talking point that would answer Justin's question. So he started saying, Mr. Speaker, I can assure the Honorable Member Papineau that this government is going to maintain high quality ozone sites. <laughs> now, Justin doesn't have my problem. I refuse to heckle. Justin doesn't have that problem. Justin, well, you know, it's not that hard a question. Google it. <laughs> of what they have to read out. So if we cooperated in the opposition benches between now and the next election, yeah. would be brilliant if we could just get them to stop. I mean, every time the NDP attacked the liberals, or I mean, it's not that I want to defend the liberals. The liberals had a terrible record. It's just that it's so pointless. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with Stephen Harper. There's just like, forget it for now. Set it aside. Deal with it later. Let's work together. We could really, we could really make Parliament a much more insightful, constructive place if not only we dealt with the conservative caucus and their, you know, fearless leader, but got the other caucuses to agree to do things that were smart and in the interest of the country and not just speaking of psychopaths. The people in the back rooms of all these parties, the spin doctors and the strategists, there's got to be a definition in some DSM somewhere for those guys. Because all they care about is winning. And they, they ever understood what the point was, they lost the thread. They don't think about what's in the interest of the country. They don't think about what's the best public policy. All they think about is the next day's headline and if they can accomplish a momentary blip in the polls for their team. And those guys should be put away and have some other job and let people, once they're elected, do the job of MPs and actually govern and actually work together and actually act like a parliament. The fact that we continue to play these mindless partisan games of a continual non-stop election is the, is the single biggest toxic substance in the political system right now.
So, number one. I'll make it very quick. Jocelyn, what did you say? There's someone right in front of me who has a question. Oh, okay. Well, there's probably 20. So, we'll, we'll do these two and then we'll go on to uh, the next one. Okay. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. <laughs> I am one of the fortunate ones in my, in my circle of uh, influence, I guess, in my, in my group's friends. I'm one of the lucky ones to have a supervisor and a team. And I'm very grateful for all the hard work you do. I'm, I'm proud that you're my MP, and I brag about it all the time. <laughs> um, but my friends yes, yes. are not so lucky. Uh, many of them are disenchanted are with politics altogether because they, their excuses are, well, politicians are all involved. Or corporations are running everything anyway. Uh, and that leads me to a question about you know, you're talking about the death of democracy or the near death of democracy. And it's it's sort of centering conversation centering around the PMO. And uh, I have a hard time believing that somebody as as small inside as Mr. Harper seems to be could really have a master plan, and I wonder if he's actually a soft puppet to corporations. He's, he's, he's afraid, because if he doesn't do what the puppet master says, his game is over. Uh, can you talk about that for a second? Whether you think there's a good one, yeah. And the second one. Okay. I wanted to ask you to address a, a similar question, and that is, I go anywhere near him, 
I feel him bristling with this sort of visceral hatred. And he said, oh, don't take it personally. He's like that with everyone. <laughs> shut down renewable energy development in Canada. 
We are the only country in the world, this is interesting, I mean, we're the only country in the world to withdrew from the Kyoto Protocol, we're the only country in the world to withdraw from the Convention on Certification, but we're the only country in the world to refuse to join the International Renewable Energy Agency. If you go to the website of the International Renewable Energy Agency, you can see that they have a beautiful graphic of the map of the world, and there's this, you know, the only country that's not in, like the only, oh, I don't know, maybe Bahrain is out, I don't know, but we're, we're basically the only country that's not in the International uh, Agency for Renewable Energy. So I find it, uh, you know, it's bad economics to decide that our fortune lies in the export of as much raw material as, po as possible with as little uh, value added as possible. Mm. Because exporting raw bitumen mixed with diluent is like exporting raw logs. Now, the oil sands have all kinds of other problems, we have greenhouse gases and so on, but one of the things that makes, you know, if the oil sands stay at where they currently are, which is about 1.8 million barrels of bitumen a day, that's actually few, less greenhouse gases than the coal-fired electricity stations of Alberta. Transalta, the commercial private sector company, uh, generates all, uh, virtually all of Alberta's energy from coal. The reason the oil sands become a larger and larger concern to the world is that Stephen Harper's personal goal, as announced, is to go to six million barrels of oil a day and triple the amount of production in the oil sands, but not process it here. Now, the reason they want to have a twin pipeline, Enbridge's twin pipeline scheme, we, we tend not to think about what's in the uh, what's in the twin yeah. <laughs> you know, is the Kitimat to northern Alberta will be pumping diluent up to Alberta to mix with the bitumen because the bitumen is so raw processed, raw unprocessed substance that you can't call it crude. Mm -hmm. It's not crude. And it, it would sit there like a lump. You couldn't you put it in a pipeline, it's just gonna it's not gonna flow. So bitumen isn't oil, it isn't crude, it isn't anything. So then they're going to be, according to Enbridge's documents in the joint review panel, they intend to buy diluent from anyone? China. Anyone? China. Middle East. So we're going to buy diluent from the Middle East, and diluent is not an actual chemical known substance. It's not like saying we're going to be buying, I don't know, molasses. We know what molasses is, it? or we're going to be buying chlorine. I mean, it's not a chemical term, diluent. Diluent is anything you want to call it, and it's basically natural gas distillate naphtha, and then they mix it with other things. So I wrote an article about this in Island Tides, and it got picked up by Ravel, and I said, okay, so what I can find out is diluent is naphtha, and sometimes they add benzene, which is a leukemia-causing aromatic hydrocarbon, and we don't know what else they add. So a guy in the oil industry sent me all the references. They add butane. <laughs> yeah, up to 5% butane is legal as part of diluent. But if they're adding butane, maybe they'll add 10% sometime, and who knows? I didn't think we added lighter fluid to potential crude, but there you go. We'll be pumping diluent along from Kitimat to northern Alberta, and all the environmental risks of that, and then mixing it in with the bitumen to put it in pipes to make it flow back, which also makes me wonder how often the pipeline will plug. Because I do remember the crazy <coughs> scheme they tried to do in Sydney where they wanted to pump the sludge from the estuary uphill towards their incinerator and it plugged. <laughs> uh, this is, I mean, if the diluent happens to run backwards and the bitumen pugs the pipe, well, I mean, if, if their system doesn't work, it's their problem because we're not going to let them build it. But the whole thing is madness. Now, why are we doing it? Back to the Koch brothers. In 2008, there were proposals for upgraders in northern Alberta. And when the financial crisis hit, like many other proposed expansions in the oil sands, this particular set of projects for upgraders was shelved. After the financial crisis ended, most of the development for northern Alberta came back on stream, but not the upgraders. Instead, now what would an upgrader do? An upgrader would take the bitumen and make it into something called synthetic crude. It could flow in a pipe. It wouldn't need a twin pipeline to bring up diluent. It would actually move along. So an upgrader would create crude that moved, and an upgrader would also allow it to go to a refinery. You could have a refinery next to your upgrader, and then in Alberta, we'd have all these tens of thousands of permanent jobs upgrading to, to make gasoline, 
And although gasoline isn't great stuff either, it's a lot safer to transit, and it doesn't, when it has a spill, cause nearly as much damage, and it would create a lot of jobs. Well, the upgraders never came back on the scene, and instead, what was proposed? The Keystone Pipeline, with vitamins and diluent to flow it all the way down to where the Koch brothers have upgraders and refineries on the Gulf of Mexico coast. So the whole Keystone Pipeline thing I don't think it would have even been proposed if it wasn't for taking the upgraders off the, the, uh, the planning horizon. And then when it looked like Keystone was giving, the U.S. government was giving Stephen Harper and his, his uh, plans for uh, getting the bitumen to the Gulf of Mexico coast, you remember how quickly he said, well, we'll have other markets, we'll go to China, suddenly Enbridge comes along. This whole idea of shipping vitamin and diluent is a non-starter from the get-go. We shouldn't be talking about vitamin at all. It's, if it's not processed, it shouldn't be exported, which is even not an environmental statement, it's just an economic statement. So Stephen Harper's notion that the way to grow the Canadian economy, that it's jobs, growth, and it, it's that's all public relations spin. This is in the interest of one group of people only. And it's the multinationals in the fossil fuel business, and not all of them, because there are a lot of multinationals in the fossil fuel business who are ready to accept carbon pricing and climate action and shifting to other sectors of their own. They've invested in renewables and hydrogen and all kinds of stuff. Like when Shell, I don't know how many of you saw this, but I'm going to stop soon. When the CEO of Shell said, Canada should have carbon pricing, do you remember that? And, and Harper and Joe Oliver said, no, we're not going to have carbon pricing. And then there's no speak. And then Joe Oliver, absolutely, you know, you, you, when the expression he has no shame is so literal in this case. He said, well, I don't care what Shell says. We're not in the pocket of the oil industry. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 